Corporal Richard Werner, United States Marine Corps, World War II. I interviewed Dick Werner in La Mesa, California almost 20 years ago, folks. It was September 28, 2005. I was there in Southern California interviewing a lot of World War II veterans um, that are featured in my films. And uh, just a great man. I got to know him and Colleen, his wife, and they actually came to a premiere showing of the Iwo Jima film in Wichita, Kansas in 2006. So it was just so, so great to see them there. Dick served with the 5th Marine Division, 5th Engineer Battalion as a combat engineer. He fired a bazooka on Iwo Jima, landed on Red Beach 2, February 19, 1945. A Marine's Marine in my book, folks. He saw a lot of combat there. Gives, gives a great answer to what freedom means to him and uh, what the flag, American flag meant to him. Um, Dick's gone, like most of my World War II veterans, but his story lives on. And I'm just so grateful to be able to bring it to you today. He's a decorated combat veteran, and um, I miss him. I want to thank Sean Johnson and Chet Howard. You guys, you, you, you're continued supporters of my work. I, I'm thanking both of you for making it possible for me to share Dick's story today. And uh, God bless you guys for your dedication to our country, to our veterans, to this project. And you mean a lot to me. I look into this camera, and, and I salute both of you. And thank you both for being so faithful and allowing many others to, to partake of these stories. So please take ownership in that. It means the world to me. I want to thank Jim Rios. Jim made up these shirts. Uh, grateful to our Vietnam veterans. And on the back it says, Welcome Home. I helped him design this. And he's graciously has sent me this one. And just want to thank you, Jim. And if you, want to, if you like this shirt, folks, just let me know. I can, I can put you in touch with Jim Rios and get you a shirt. So but in, in a tribute to our Vietnam veterans. So I wanted to give a little plug for Jim. Thank you, Jim, for the shirt that just came today in the mail and it's on me right now. Okay. Folks, I tell you what, there's so much going on right now in our world and I'm just so grateful. I thank my God that I can serve him and my country through the lens of my camera continually. It's a labor of love. It's 21 and a half years plus now into this project, over a thousand interviews and um, if I don't say it enough, thank you to everybody that's helped support this work in my Voices of History radio station that goes 24 hours a day. That eventually will air the stories that are heard here on the YouTube channel, so I'm just really grateful for that. And uh, if any of you would like to help with this work, there's information in the video description, in the comment section of my videos, and on my website, LarryCapetto.com. You can donate to this project, take ownership in it, and a lot of you are being touched and blessed by these stories. I want to keep it going, and I believe it will keep going, but we need help with, with this project. Like I said, it's a, it's a labor of love, and I'm just so grateful that I can bring these stories, especially to our younger generation and the day that we live in, folks. It's so important to get this living history into the hands of our kids, and they can download the app for free uh, for the radio station, Voices of History Radio at the app stores and uh, they can become a part of this project too. So, Okay, let's honor Dick Werner with this interview and this story. It's just like yesterday, it was 20 years ago almost and uh, like I said in California. So share these videos folks, subscribe to this channel if you haven't, that helps in what we're doing. Like I said, I don't monetize these videos. There's no money to be made through the, the views or the clicking on commercials. I don't think that's right to interrupt. Some people don't understand why I'm doing that. Well, you need to walk in my shoes for a while and, and see what's going on here. Let's get into Dick's story. I'll talk to you next time. God bless you. Basically, first of all, you were at the 5th Marine Division, landed on February 19th on Iwo Jima. Can you tell me, Dick, what you remember about maybe the night before the landing, where you were, and what your thoughts were the night before you guys landed on Iwo? Uh, we, we, had, we had transferred from APAs to LSTs in Saipan, and then uh, 
The voyage wasn't very comfortable. There was no place for us to sleep. There's no quarters on an LST for troops. One morning we woke up and there was Task Force 58. My God, I've never seen so many ships in all my life. And uh, that evening, it uh, seems like, as I can remember, no one was, no one was frightened. No one was scared. I wasn't, uh, if I recall it. And I talked to a friend on, on deck, and he was telling me that he had this awful feeling that he wasn't going to get through. He just wasn't going to make it. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd heard this, this sort of thing in movies, you know, things like that. But he just thought he just had for sure that he wasn't going to make this. And uh, other than that, uh, things were do this, do that, get this ready, get that ready, go here, go there, do this, do that. Take a look at the uh, topography map again, what the island looked like. And uh, it actually was rather calm, it was nothing. But in the morning, all hell broke loose. <laughs> things were different in the morning. We, we get up at, uh, I think, about 3, 3.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. had prayer services, had good food. They, they served a very good meal. Ammunition was issued to us. I had a bazooka. And uh, ammunition was issued to us. And then uh, we had to go down to the tank deck where the tanks were. And I walked by a 20 millimeter gun, and I thought, that guy looks familiar. And someone lived about four houses from me back in Ohio. I didn't get a chance to talk to him. He was in a hurry to get down there. I think there must have been, I don't know, 18 or 20 tanks on an LST, I'm not sure. We got down there and they had given us a, about a quarter pound of Hershey's chocolate. I think an energy builder. And then they started up the engines. And the fumes were terrible. An LST has a ramp that comes down the front like this. Two doors open up and a ramp falls down and there's big cables that holds it up on both sides. As, as, as our turn, as our turn around, uh, came up to uh, go down the ramp, it was just like a tank. The track on them is just like a, a Sherman tank. So that when the, the, uh, the, alligator, uh, the alligator gets to the door, the nose goes up and then it falls down like this. But when it fell down, it turned kitty compwise and we got stuck. We couldn't go back or we couldn't go forward. We jogged back and forth and we had, we had little uh, life preservers that you squeezed a hand squeezing capsule. Well, we were standing on ammunition boxes and we was on about a 60 degree slant. Everything was up against your back. You couldn't, you couldn't get your hands free. You couldn't do anything. So they joggled back and they joggled some more. And pretty soon it tore loose and we thought, oh boy. It started to float. So we was in the water and they're, uh, uh, they're only about two feet out of the water when they're in the water. When they're on land, they're about seven feet tall. And they had a destroyer, I think it was a destroyer, that had a, a big white sheet and when this big white sheet dropped, that was a signal that now we head for the beach. And we were still having a decent time. I mean, we were laughing and telling jokes and things wasn't, the island was qu quite a ways off. And I think, if I remember, I think we, we uh, all of our exposed skin, we painted white. I think we had some white stuff that we put on our skin. And we got within, oh, a thousand yards, something like that, of shore. And my God, all hell broke loose. The tank right beside us took a hit and it went down. And uh, we took a hit in, the, uh, in the, the gun turret. And one of the guys there was, well, he was supposed to spray the beach when we got within such and such yardage from it. And uh, a shell went through the turret and he turned around and looked and he didn't have a hand. His hand was gone. And they told us before we left, they said, when you get close to the beach, you're going to come to some coral. 
and said the driver is going to swing around the coral and park parallel with the beach so you can get out on the ocean side. Things got all fouled up. Didn't do that. Didn't do it. Pointed right straight into the beach, was about half in, half out of the water. And the Japanese had, uh, had the beach zeroed in, completely zeroed in from, from, from their positions. My bazooka washed out to sea, retrieved it. And then this, this, there, there was probably only maybe 10, 15, 20 feet of flat beach and then it went uphill. Black, black sand. So we hovered there, couldn't get out, shells were, shells were hitting everywhere. And all of a sudden, oh my God, this is, we're in war. And it, it, everything, everything was different. You wanted to cry, you wanted to see, where's dad, where's mom? How can I get out of here? We took a hit. Three of our people got in a, a crater hole. And a shell came in, and all we found was a hip, a piece of hip. That's all that was there. Things were fouled up. The, the, uh, we were supposed to, there was supposed to be a railroad track someplace there that was gone. We uh, didn't have any. Uh, Communication wire was using runners to get uh, messages back and forth. Life was bad. Life was bad. You were a bazooka. What was your title again? What was? Com was combat engineer, fifth engineer battalion. Fifth engineer battalion. Uh, what was your rank? Uh, corporal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hit on Red Beach too. That probably was uh, 200, 300 yards from Suribachi, I think. Mm -hmm. So what, do you remember approximately what time of the day you landed? This was, a, this was Afternoon. around no, was early in the morning, about 9.30 in that area, 9, 9 o'clock, 9.30. I had heard that the first few waves in, they didn't do nothing, and then all of a sudden everything opened up. Is that kind of what happened? Yeah. And you were yeah. coming in probably when it had started. Yeah. 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 So you landed with an LST. You didn't get off onto a smaller landing craft. No, we did get off a smaller okay, craft. Okay, so you went onto a Higgins boat or an LVT? Or... Yeah, it, it was, well, it, in those days it was called an alligator. Okay, yeah. Uh, and you couldn't get out. It didn't have a, a back that opened up. You had to get up on the side and roll off. Mm -hmm. uh, but those is what brought us to shore. So you get to shore and it's chaos. It's chaos. Mm -hmm. Chaos. What was your job when you hit the beach? What were you supposed to do? Uh, I, well, I had a bazooka, of course. That was the obvious thing there was tanks, mm -hmm. pillboxes. But our, our main job was, uh, well, what we'd been trained a lot for was building bridges and blowing bridges up, of which we had no use for them there. That, that didn't apply. And that wasn't. Uh, Mines, uh, getting out uh, the the mines on the beach, clearing clearing uh, paths for our tr tanks to get through, our trucks to get through. Probing for mines, b blowing caves shut, blowing water wells. We uh, we we kind of staggered. We didn't we didn't move like this. We kind of staggered here, came back over here. If somebody wanted us over here, would go over here. Move back and forth to do our job. We had an interpreter when we went to a, 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 an opening in a cave, and they would try to get him to come out, and of which they, they never did. And then we had composition C. It's a, like a clay mold, 10-pound composition C satchel that we would take up, plant it, get three or four there, and blow the cave shut. Sometimes we didn't make it so well. Sometimes we did. So you helped um, get blow up caves and all that. 
what was the progression of that? Was there a flamethrower involved, hand grenades, or just composition C, or what were you? No, we didn't have a flamethrower with, with our company. We had machine guns and bazookas and mortars. Uh, the flamethrowers played a big part in it, a big part. I'd, I'd seen, uh, I'd seen one Japanese soldier laying on the ground, and he was, uh, he was actually cut in two at his stomach part. There was no legs, which was done by a flamethrower. Very, very good or bad weapon. Mm -hmm. you know? So again, tell me, how would you determine where there was a cave? Would there be an initial assault on it? Would you just fire into it? How, how did you take one of those caves and blow it up? What, what, do, you, what do you do? Well, Walk me through that. What we would do, we would get a, a notice or a request uh, to, to close a cave. And then we had a, a Japanese interpreter with us, and we'd get as close as we could, and he would yell for him to come out and surrender, of which that was against their being. So we'd wait a certain given period of time. And, and, and in the meantime, Iwo was so small that you could never get away from fire. You, you just didn't get up and walk around. It just wasn't things that you would do. So after a while, we would take our Composition C, satchel charges, one, one at a time, wiggle his way up to the entrance. And when we got enough there, then we would detonate them and close the shut. So we, were you crawling around? Were they firing machine guns at you? What was oh, going yeah. on? I mean. Oh, yeah. One, uh, one cave, we, uh, we, we sent a man up, got shot. Sent another man up, kind of a different route, he got shot. So there was something that had to be done. The, we, the, the, the frontal approach wasn't, wasn't, so we circled around and blew it from on top. So the, uh, the caves were always dangerous because they were black, you couldn't see in them. And there was always somebody in there that wanted to keep you away. It was, you know, there was, there was so many people killed on Iwo. There was 22,000 Japanese there, and I think there's 21,500 killed or something like that. And we had seven or 8,000 killed. That it, was, that it was hard to go someplace to dig a foxhole, that you, just, you didn't stick some, in someone's belly or something almost. I mean, that's exaggerating some, but it, but it happened. And the Japanese used to drag their dead back with uh, some kind of vehicle so that we wouldn't be aware of their casualties. And then uh, quick bury them in shallow, shallow graves. There's a, I can remember when I got home, we had, we had gone in a number of pillboxes that had been, the Japanese had been in there dead maybe for a week, something like that. And I can remember going, when I come home, going into a house that they had just built and the plaster the, pla the fresh plaster smell was exactly the same as in those wet uh, pillboxes. It almost made me sick. Those things stay with you. You, you can't... I can think about... Uh, we were carrying ammunition up to the front. A very dear friend of mine. And uh, we got caught in a mortar barrage. And we jumped in a couple of holes. And it looked like it was just some, some harassing fire. It didn't look like the, that they had a target. They were just dropping shells at random. So it was in there 10, 15 minutes, and this thing eased off. And this friend of mine says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he said, things seem quiet, I'm gonna take a look. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think you better. And he stood up. And he, and he got cut in two. He got cut in two. So, was it like a mortar or what came in? What mortar. Mortar. How old are you now, Dick? 80. So you were 19, maybe, on the island? Just 17 and a half, yeah. 18. Had you ever been in combat before? No. So you're seeing this unfold before you and your mind's probably trying to figure it all out or did it seem real at the time? Or like a movie yeah. or what, I mean? You see, 
back in those days, everybody was standing in line to get in the service. It wasn't that people were trying to get out, they were trying to get in. It was a, a thing that you, that you simply had to do, you know. And I never thought, I never thought of, I never thought about those things, you know. I, I didn't think about that. And when, you, and when, and when, it, when it first comes across, as a matter of fact, it seems like a lot of times you didn't have time to feel sorry for someone getting killed. It, it, the, the word would always pass down to you, Ralph, Ralph got it, Fred's gone, like that. And it didn't, you know, okay. And sometimes I would th often think, maybe, a terrible thing to think, I'd often think, well, I'm glad it was him and not me. Terrible thing to think, you know. But uh, all those things that, my God, men will do this to men? Awful thing. Awful thing. What do you think got you through those hard times? Was it your faith in God, your training? What, what got you through and kept you going? I know I did a lot of praying. All of the, they call it foxhole religion. You know, I did an awful lot of that. Uh, one out of every three was either killed or wounded. I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, something that you carry with you all your life. You 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 can't you uh, something that you cannot get away from. I remember when I come home, I never discussed it. I never talked to him, anyone about it. I wouldn't drive a car. Uh, something was something was sealed up in me about it. I don't know. I couldn't. Uh, What do, you, what do you think got your attention with my little article in the paper? What, what, what prompted you to, to get a hold of me, you think? Well, a friend gave it to me. I didn't see the article. A friend that was in the Marine Corps also gave, it, uh, gave, that, uh, gave that to my wife to give to me. And I thought, nah, I don't, that's, not, that's not my thing. I don't think I'd do it. And then my wife said, uh, have you called that number yet? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'm going to do it. She said, why don't you call? Then I got a hold of a very nice gentleman. It was a divine connection. It was yeah. that you called that day. Yeah. Tell, tell me about now. You're on the island. The battle's progressing. Um, are you making any progress? Are you guys just going from one cave to the other? I mean, is there some well, order in what you're doing? It wasn't, it, it wasn't like the infantry with us. We were being recalled. We, well, sometimes they only perhaps made 100 yards a day progress. Or there'd be a Banzai charge and uh, you might have to fall back some. But uh, oh, yeah, ours, ours wasn't uh, the way the infantry was. They had their positions to clear. We would be called over here uh, to uh, probe for some mines, or over here to blow some water wells, or maybe they wanted a cave closed up here someplace. So we, we kind of staggered our uh, effort, if you will, back and forth instead of one forward job. I know what we was about. Uh, we were still taking the first airfield, I think, when they put the flag up on it. Let's talk about that. Tell me where you were, if you saw it, or how you felt when the flag went up. Uh, of course, I didn't see it go up, naturally. But we were, I think, taking the first airfield. We were about in the middle, I think, from Surabachi on, on the 23rd. Uh, and I didn't see it at that time, of course. We had, we had too many other things to do. The Japanese had, had uh, barrels buried in the ground on, on the runway. And they would uh, hide down these barrels and they would stick up and drop knee mortars, about five shells, and go back down their barrels again. And, uh, we were trying to clean those out when, uh, on the 23rd, I think that's what we were doing, I believe. You, know. but, uh, you couldn't. Uh, progress was something that was, uh, it didn't come easy. There was caves and tunnels. That, 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 that island was bombed 72 straight days before we got there. 
As a matter of fact, I think the, the scuttlebutt was that we were supposed to take Hajima, Chichijima, and Iwo Jima in a weekend, mm. those, those three islands. And uh, every, everyone thought it was going to be almost a cakewalk, or they thought it wasn't going to be very uh, difficult. But I think they went, all went down their caves and just waited until things cleared up. And uh, had us had us zeroed in, like I said before, had us zeroed in on, on the beaches. So when you were coming in on that alligator, you said the mood was kind of light, and then about a thousand yards out, you saw a tank get blown up, and it's it's getting serious now. This is this is going to be a maybe uh -huh. a tough situation or uh -huh. not? What you thought? Was there was there a, a sergeant or lieutenant on that little landing craft that was giving orders to stay down, or what was? I mean, what? no, I think there was a. I think there was a sergeant on there, but it, it, uh, Is it like in the movies, you're going to shore, John Wayne says lock and load and no. you run out, I mean. No. Yeah. We, uh, we were coming in, we were getting closer. This island was looming out ahead of us. And uh, we still didn't have in our minds what war was about. It, uh, uh, to us, it was kind of a, th uh, not a thrill, but a, Type thing. It hadn't settled into us because no, no, no bang bangs had exploded close to us. Nothing had happened that was going to uh, cause us to change our mind yet. Until we got within about oh, I don't know, eight, nine hundred yards from the beach, and then that's when they zeroed in on us coming in. And uh, my God, it's just it, everything changed. It seemed like you grew up right then. And then it continued on until we hit until we got into the beach. And then got our on this little slanted black sand beach. Just sat there and wait, cry once in a while, say something about mom or dad under your breath. Mm -hmm. See somebody fall. See three of them land together. See somebody without a leg. It's not good. Did you try to help any of these people, or did the corpsman just take care of all that? Corman used it to, uh, to, took care of it. Our, our corpsman was killed about five minutes after he got on the beach. He was, uh, but again, I say it's one of those things that you just didn't get up and walk around. Did you know of Father Bradley, the Catholic chaplain? Had you known of him with the 5th Marine Division? No. Okay. I do know that we saw a, a, a chaplain take a hit. Uh, I don't know the circumstances about it, I don't remember that, but it blew off his buttocks. And uh, he was flipping around like a chicken. Uh, remember how a yeah, chicken used to flop around when they cut its head off? And we were trying to get a whole hold of him so we could help him. And uh, of course he was, every, everything was hanging out of him. And, and uh, didn't make it, of course. Grotesque stories, all, every, everything is grotesque. So you saw the chaplain get hit? It was a murder? No, we didn't. Okay. It was after he got hit. We had, he had just gotten hit. When he we, was a chaplain? Uh -huh. Catholic chaplain? Or I, I think he was Catholic. Okay. I'm, I'm not real sure. And then a friend of mine went to get a picture out of his knapsack. A sniper shot him. Just a... Unbelievable things, you know. And how, how, looking back now, 60 years ago, I mean, what does Iwo Jima mean to you today? Any significance in your life? Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts about Iwo Jima today? I'd, I'd, uh, I'd often thought about going back to see it. I'd like to see it, you know. But I have, uh, I have this panic situation stuff, and as, as a matter of fact, I retired from Delta Airlines. But I have this panic thing where I can't fly, I can't uh, close doors, don't do me any good anymore. I can't stand that sort of thing. And, uh, but I'd love to go back to see it. Uh, uh, well, just, just as a side thought, not that this is gonna happen, but um, I wanna go back next March with the historical tour. He gave me an information card, and I, I tried to go last March, I couldn't go, but 
if the situations availed themselves for both of us, I would want to go back with a veteran. And if, if you have an interest, maybe after the well, just sometime, maybe we can at least think about it. If anything else, you know, mm -hmm. not we're going to commit to it, but mm -hmm. anyway, we'll talk about that later. But uh, I want to ask you a very serious question now. Um, hold on here. Just give me a second here. Okay. Um, I've talked to a lot of Marines. I've talked to a lot of World War II veterans. And I, I sometimes ask this question. I'm going to ask you, you know, you saw a lot of men that didn't make it. And did you ever think of why you came back? Did that question ever cross your mind? Did you ever, some people feel guilty for coming back. Did, how did you feel about that? I mean, why did you come back, Dick? It's, it's, uh, you know, I've thought about that over the last maybe 15, 20, 30 years. I thought about that. I got in a wreck one time and I didn't get hurt. And I always say, thank you, Father. I, I always, I, even on the golf course. <laughs> uh, any number of things have happened and I've been extremely lucky. And I thought to myself, any so, or ever so many times, that one of every three was either killed or wounded on an island. And sometimes you, uh, just, just walking and you're dead, you know. And I don't know, I've really, I've, I've thought about that time and time again. For some reason, maybe the good Lord don't want me to go yet. That's all I, I can't, I can't come up with anything. But I've thought about it tremendously. I've thought about it a lot, an awful lot. Someone told me one time that, that Iwo Jima was like walking in rain, trying to keep away from drops, from uh, dew drops. Yeah. I was extremely lucky. What about the, the, did you see the cemeteries on the island when they erected mm -hmm. those? Did you walk through them? Did you? As a matter of fact, uh, our job at sometimes was picking up dead and putting them in a weasel, thing called a weasel. And uh, unfortunately, we were handing them uh, just like cordwood or something. Get a hold of the shoulders, get a hold of the feet, stack them. That was part of our job, some we weren't either carrying things up to the front, we weren't blowing caves, blowing water wells, or something, then we were picking up dead. And the 5th Division has a cemetery. I, I think the 4th Division has one there also, I would imagine. Your microphone came off here. Hold on a second. Okay, here we go. Okay, yeah, the 5th and the 4th, and had you walked through those, and uh, were there names that you could read? Or no, no, I, I, I didn't walk through them. Okay. We, uh, was, when it come time for us to leave, we hadn't had our shoes off in 36 days. Everything was pretty bad, and the Navy was sending, if I remember right, that they were sending clothes into us in barrels, and I hope I got this right, if I remember correctly. There was a recruit that came in, and he had a, a brand new M1, and he was playing with it, and he shot one of our guys, mm. killed him. Mm. He had a little chair on the back of his <laughs> back of his uh, pack, and uh, shot him and killed him. Just an accident. They also had a, they had a little piece of coral reef offshore, about oh, 300 yards, something like that. And every night, a couple of Japanese soldiers would swim out there with some mortars. Mm -hmm. And all night long, they would hammer it. And every morning, a grumman would go over and bomb them. Every night, they'd swim back out, and every morning, a grumman would go over and bomb them. But they caused havoc all night around them. Those the little knee mortars. So 36 days, you're on the island, um, and your basic job again was blowing up caves. I mean, that's what you did basically the whole time. And, and mines and clearing paths for trucks to get through and things of that nature. Tell me a little bit about the camaraderie and the pride of the Marine Corps. One, one day I went into our bank, and I, I, usually, I usually wear my Marine Corps ball cap. And it's not that I'm advertising anything, it's just that I meet people that uh, say, hey, Jarhead, hey, Marine, 
and we stopped and talked. I met someone and, uh, one day that uh, what was across his hat was uh, Black Sheep Squadron. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell with you? Mm -hmm. And he was one of the pilots mm -hmm. in a wheelchair. And uh, anyway, I walked into the bank with my hat on and the president or whoever, vice president, whoever it was, come over and says, we're an elite group, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And it just kind of, because I, I feel we are also. I, and I certainly don't mean to, con, to criticize any of the others at all. But there's something, there's just something about being a Marine. And once you are one, you are one. You know, it's a lot of pride, a lot of pride. And you guys stuck together and you depended on your buddy, right? Uh, especially like at Iwo Jima. Absolutely, absolutely. I heard a story of, of one gentleman in Salt Lake City who instinctively threw himself on a grenade and he lived through it. He had the good fortune of putting his helmet over the grenade, which took some of the concussion, but it still blew him up. Yeah. But he said he didn't even think about it. He just did it. He just did it. Yeah, mm -hmm. to save his buddies. Yeah. Um, why did we need Iwo Jima? Well, why was it so important that we take that small island? Because the planes coming from uh, the Marshalls bombing Japan was having trouble on their on their re return home. They had two two airstrips on Iwo, Matoyama Airfield One and Two, and they were shooting down our aircraft. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, B-29s crashed on the airstrip while we were there on his belly. It didn't hurt anyone, but he got down. And they said, so I think it read afterwards uh, that uh, something like that saved uh, 2,000 or 2,700 pilots for taking that island, that these planes now could fly, because their fighters couldn't fly that distance and give them protection. And they needed it. They needed it very badly. So it's good to know that, that uh, that some good came out of it, you know. It definitely is, uh, there has to be a definite need to ask somebody to go out and die. There has to be a reason for it. Because it's a big, big thing to ask. Looking back 60 years, Dick, as a World War II veteran and as an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you? Well, I was in, I, I occupied Japan for a year also. And let me tell you, it was something coming back to the United States again. That's freedom. That's freedom. Uh, you never know what it is until you don't have it, until it's not there any longer. Rules, rules are different, laws are different. Everything is different. And it's not like uh, coming back to your old hometown again seeing people saying what they want to say, walk where they want to walk, pray who they want to pray for. It's a great thing, a great thing. What would you tell a young person today who maybe doesn't know anything about war or the sacrifices of war? What would you tell a young person about the price for freedom? Freedom is very expensive, very, very expensive. Uh, you, you have to know, well, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's something that you, that you, that you uh, think about. You don't say, I'm fighting for freedom today. That's not something, that's not something that goes through your mind. It's just there. You, you have it within you. you. That's not something that you, that you have to talk to yourself to get it to happen. It's something that's within you then, you know, and, uh, you, and uh, things happen the way they should happen then. Freedom is a, it's just something that you, you, you take care of. It's not something, that's, not something that comes out of a book or something, you know. It's God-given. What does this country and the American flag mean to you? Oh, God. I, I write some poems, and I wrote a poem one time about, uh, I was walking down the street, and I saw a flag at a house, and uh, as I walked by it, I thought uh, this was all in a poem way. 
I thought somehow that that flag really uh, really looks 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 good to me. And uh, why uh, why did I stop and turn around and take a look at that flag the second time? And then toward the end of the poem it says, because I saw one of those on an Iwo Jima hill. You know? And uh, that's uh, it, it, it means a lot. It means an awful lot. And you know, things, sometimes you don't have to be told what to do. Things, things have to be done. You know? Do you think our society is forgetting about World War II? And if so, do you think it's important that we remember? I think they are forgetting about World War II. I think absolutely they are. I had a little brooch here showed the flag raising on Iwo Jima it was around a chain. And I've had high school students and even adults want to know what club I belong to to get that thing about those people dancing or something. They had no idea what it was. And I'd tell them, and, oh, nothing. It meant nothing to them. You know? It's, uh, yes, they, I, I think that they, I think, I think, uh, now this, this might not be the proper thing to say, but I think people should see casualties the way we see casualties. I think there'd be a lot less wars. It's like I can tell you what it is to see a man laying there trying to put his guts back in his belly, and it goes right over your head. I mean, you'll say, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's too bad. But if you see it, you know, it changes, changes everything. You can tell stories, all, all kind of war stories, and uh, people will shake their heads say, or say, oh my, or something like that. But it doesn't hit home, you know. It's a gruesome thing to see, but war is gruesome. We're asked to go out and do gruesome things. So they should see some of the gruesome things we have to do. That's not a very popular subject, I realize that. But I feel that way. Sure. People have no idea, uh, no idea in the world what, what war's like. Mm -hmm. And the wars they see in movies are uh, terrible things. That's nothing, you know. They don't know what, what it is to, to cry, to wet your pants, to shake so bad you can't hold still at times, you know see somebody with an arm and a leg gone. It's gruesome but true. War is gruesome. How has that affected your life? I mean, you came home, you went to work, now it's 60 years later. I mean, does it bother you or is it just like a distant fading memory or is it something that you live every day? I mean... Well, I don't think I was, I don't think I was bothered by it for the first 40 years. It didn't, I, well, like I told you, I, I didn't talk about it to anybody. I didn't say nothing about it. I didn't, I just, it's just something I didn't think about anymore. I just, it, perhaps God just took it out of my mind. I don't know. But throughout the last 10, 15 years, it seems like it's really, really hitting home with me. It's, it's, the, 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 the meaning is, uh, is there more, it seems. And maybe it's because I got older, I don't know. But uh, so many thoughts come back to me now. And I try to think, I try to think sometimes, we sent three men up to, 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 to blow a cave shut and, and they got killed. And I try to think, I wonder if the platoon leader, after that was all said and done, ever thought, my God, maybe I could have done that another way. Maybe I could have circled and done it another way and they'd still be alive. I think about those things. War's hell. Can you uh, just, I'm just going to ask you this one more time because you've, I've asked you twice, but just one more time, walk me through what happens when you take over a cave, maybe a little slower. Just help me visualize. I mean, you said, well, they tell you over there, you go do it. You, 
seat, whatever, you blow it. I mean, walk me through the steps to take, okay. to take a cave. Uh, we'd usually get a call uh, for a cave. Well, perhaps the cave opening would maybe be as high as this room, or maybe it'd only be six feet high. It just depends what, you know, what, what was in there. And we would approach uh, crawling or what have you, dodging, and, uh, until we got within some, some kind of distance that if we didn't get fired upon first, you know, and then an interpreter would yell that come out and surrender and you will be treated uh, uh, under the Geneva Convention and all this and that so, and uh, nothing would happen and maybe he would change position and uh, yell again for the command to come out. And perhaps sometimes they would even shoot, just, just shoot. And so this would go on maybe for a half hour. Then if nothing happened, then we would start to formulate a, a plan to get our satchel charges up there to the opening. And when that was usually, would, depending on the size, uh, how many satchel charges we used. And uh, maybe we'd have to go on top and set a couple on top and two or three on the sides and, you know, it would blow shut. And that's job done. So were you doing things, wiring things up, and then someone does something to blow it up? Or how? Yeah, uh, uh, they had what they called a scratch detonator. Okay. Something like striking a match on a thing. We'd go up and these uh, would be wired together. And the last one there would pull, some, would, would pull the detonator. Would there be like fire in the hole or anything like that, like with a Bangalore torpedo, or was that just, I mean, what would be the indication you're gonna blow? Well. Or is there? Usually uh, we were the only ones right in that area. That there, and, uh, are you acquainted with Bangalore torpedoes? I'm familiar with it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But a lot of what I've heard is from the movies, which isn't right, but after talking to a number of you guys, I get a little bit better picture of what happened. Some of the pillboxes, I guess, or whatever, wasn't there like a grenade that for a flamethrower and then the combat engineers would blow it up or something later? You came in at the end, right? Basically yeah. blew them up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to visualize this, yeah. you know. Well, uh, the, the movies kind of dramatizes those kind of things, you know. If, uh, then of course we were going uphill all the time. We were fighting, uh, they were looking down on us. Uh, we didn't have it. we didn't have an occasion to to do that. Not saying that it didn't happen. I'm, I'm sure it probably did someplace, but uh, you'd have to get up there awfully close mm -hmm. in, in order, you know, to throw a grenade through a, a port opening. So at the end of the 36 days, was there a, a big hurrah? You're leaving. Was there a celebration? Was it just like we're going on? And what, describe that last day if you can remember when you left the island. What what did you feel? No, we just uh, all the, our our company just got together what we had, and we had orders to report over here on this beach on on the east side of Surabachi, and we waited there in the beach for the navy. Was no hurrahs, no nothing. At what point did you know you were going to leave? The day before, a week before? Or I uh, I really don't know. I, I I'm sorry, I can't. Okay. That doesn't come to me. Uh, they uh, they said uh, the the. The, uh, the enemy ceased to cause a problem maybe a, a week or two weeks before, no, a, a week or so before they actually did. There was still killing going on everywhere when they said the island is, is, is now secured, which they always do because there's a time element there involved. But if I recall, I think we uh, just, we had orders to report uh, on such and such a beach down there and uh, I'll wait for the Navy to come in and get us. Uh, 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 there was no, I don't, I don't recall of any hurrahs or anything like that. People were, um, I don't know, kind of wasn't there, I guess. And you could still hear, hear uh, 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 gunshots. A anyway. Well, when you left the island, you were away from the island, that night, did you lay down in your bed and think, oh my gosh, what did we just do, or did it... Or you know what I'm saying? What, what were you, do you remember anything? Was it, was it like, my goodness, or I'm, I'm glad I got out of there, or whatever? Or do you reflect back on all that, or? Uh, maybe the first few I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recollect that, and, okay, that's okay, don't. and I, uh, I, I don't remember getting off, off the beach even. I'm, I'm sure they sent Higgins boats in, something like that. Yeah. And, uh, 
our, our, our sleeping quarters weren't all that great either. <laughs> Stacked about seven high like this. So when you were on the island, did you guys sleep? Did you eat? Did you take showers? And... No. So. Oh no. We we st we stayed in our foxholes. The third night it rained. Mm. It rained, and I mean, water like this in there, and there you said. We had K rations, and uh, we, we never changed clothes. All the time was there. So how did you look? And how Crusty. did you smell after 36 days? I mean, well, we all smelled about the same, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It was, uh, it was out in the open. I can't recall any. The only thing I could smell was someone that hadn't been taken care of or something like that. But, uh, it, I think it was uh, raw, raw. Maybe after we got aboard ship, something like that. But it, but it was more of a uh, subdued type thing. It doesn't seem like it uh, was was the type was the the, the place to have a party. Yeah. Uh, you know, wasn't. Uh, and then going back, President Roosevelt died. Mm -hmm. I remember that, and I remember I slid down on the deck and I sat there and I cried and I cried and I cried. I thought they were, they, they could walk on water, you know. Tell me about, just briefly, we're just about out of tape, but what's, what's the sound and the smell of battle? What, what, do you have any comments on that, the sound or the smell of battle? Sound is, uh, sound drives you nuts because you can hear them coming. Then you hear one hit and it don't go off, and that scares you to death. Uh, snipers have shot at me. I've heard them zip by my head. Uh, smell isn't bad unless you get in a close quarters someplace. And then there's usually uh, some been in there dead for a week or two. And, uh, the, the Japanese had a, a, a different diet than we did. And uh, their smell was a little bit different. It was, uh, If I remember, I think it was a C-47, a C-47, an old C-47 that was flew over one time spraying bodies. Uh, I'd, I, was, I was hiding behind a rock, and I heard a noise. I stuck my head out, and it seemed like that 47 was right here, and they were spraying uh, lye or something. I think that's close to the end. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing for me. Okay. Just give me a second here. I've asked all the Marines to do this, if it's okay with you. I, at the end of my films, I always ask for a salute into the camera. Could you give me a salute I into the camera? I certainly will. Go ahead, Dick.